Hey, Wayne. How you doing, man? Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, what do you mean? I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. Our, our episode tonight, our roast episode, is, is uh, focusing on politics and comedy. So obviously, yeah. any conversation about politics and comedy has to culminate in a conversation about George Carlin. But before we get there, you know, I've never had I've never had a bona fide comedy professor on the show before. So I thought maybe you could school us a little bit and smarten this, us this up a little a, bit. You know, uh, in the early 70s, I think it was 71 or 72, Albert Brooks wrote an article for Esquire about uh, com this comedy school, this fake comedy school. And, uh, and then I later ended up directing this short film based on it. Famous school for comedians. How many times have you gotten nice laughs at a party, had a friend turn to you and say, you know something? That was pretty funny. You should think about being a comedian. Well, your friend was right. So the whole idea of it was so absurd <laughs> that it was being parodied even then, and now it's come to fruition just to show you how far the society's uh, dropped that I'm, I can now be a professor uh, stand up and stand up history. So it's not, you, not a great you, development, not great. <laughs> no, no, and you have an excellent book on the history of stand up as well. Yes, so yeah, you're, thank you. You're, thank you're the man, yeah. Um, yeah, so where would you start if you were teaching, uh, you know, American political comedy 101? You know, we don't want to go back to the Greeks. Who has time for that? But I mean, where would you start sort of in the well, recent history first, of things? In the stand-up arena, I'd start with, Twain, with uh, not Twain, I would start with Will Rogers. Yeah. I felt like he was the first one that really did topical, daily, from the papers, pulled from the headlines, exactly what they do on SNL updates, the exact same style. It's and And he also you know, which gently roasts politicians. There's this incredible footage of him, I believe in Los Angeles, at this big rally for Roosevelt before he became president. So it must have been in the, you know, late early 30s before, I guess the elections in 32. So maybe 31 or something. And it's just great. Roosevelt is cracking up and he's making fun of the fact he's not the president yet, that he's still like a governor or something. And oh, that's cool. it's just wonderful. It was really... Just wonder. I mean, that now it's a little more vicious. Yeah, yeah. You know, and people are way more partisan than they were. But, but the idea of it was just, uh, just wonderful. And then that, so that I would say he was the first. And then, uh, then later in the uh, in the nineteen fifties, around fifty three, this guy named Mort Saul came there out of go, San Francisco, yeah. and he was. But they called him uh, Will Rogers with fangs. Oh, like okay. That was in, yeah, in the yeah. in, in that. Uh, that Time Magazine article about him. That's how they described him. So he was very much part of that. And then we were off. Can I also briefly speak about Bob Hope, who also did very, again, I would say gentle, but fun uh, political commentary about presidents and stuff. It right. wasn't, you know, he didn't eviscerate President Truman or anything, or Eisenhower, but, you know, he was, he, so he also, so that became part of like, a comedian's uh, tool bag was like to do a little quip about what's going on with Stevenson or what's going on with the the hearings with McCarthy or something like that. Right, so, right. So it's been going on for a while. It's been going on for a while. And then, uh, but then you want to talk about George Carlin, right? Yeah, eventually I'd love to get, yeah, Carlin, of course. Yeah, I mean, we could also talk about the Smothers Brothers and all the counterculture stuff and, you know, the SNL, Weekend Update, Daily Show. We've right. you know, we've come a long way, but through throughout that whole thread is Carlin, actually. I mean, he, he spans the whole thing, although he evolved as a comedian, if you want right. to talk there about was, that a little bit. Yeah, there was also a show uh, right, right after the Smothers Brothers called Laughing that also did... They did news of the day and news of the future and stuff like that. So and, they could, and Nixon was famously on laughing. Right. Nixon. As a candidate. Yeah. As a candidate, not as a president. And so I, you know, so it's been going on for a while. And then obviously in 75 SNL, George Carlin is host of the very first very Saturday first, Night Live. Right. And by the way, a little tidbit, uh, Lorne Michaels never had him back on after that. Oh, wow. I don't remember yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. He, he did another SNL, but not while Lorne Michaels was was running the show. Yeah, uh, yeah, he was very coked up that entire week. And, you know, Lorne wanted him to do sketches. And he was like, can I just do monologues? This is what I do. Right. <laughs> can I just do, just let me... So throughout the show, he did multiple monologues, right. including a religious one at the very end that Cardinal Cook caught a little part of. But... So that was, you know, Carlin was very much a, uh, like a loner. 
in the comedy world. He didn't have like a bunch of friends. It's not like Steve Martin, who was like a little posse and all of these guys. He was like, he was, he had his family and that, that was basically it. Yeah. And, and so, uh, yeah, he started out, you know, it's interesting when we did the research for this documentary and you can tell the people how I'm involved. You were the producer of the documentary. The producer, yeah. George Carlin's American, American Dream, it's called. Yeah. Directed the- by Judd Apatow and uh yeah and mike monfiglio and so, kelly kelly carlin was heavily involved as well yeah right? she's an executive producer yeah. she's above me right i had a report to her yeah yes. <laughs> so, so it's interesting because early on when he was one of the byproducts of mort Saul's ascent in the late 50s was that a lot of comedians started doing political stuff Right. And there's this great quote from Woody Allen, who was starting out in the early 60s and got a great review in the New York Times. And he was, you know, he had been a, a, a writer already. They were already re- written for, for Sid Caesar and stuff. What was interesting was they pointed out that he didn't do any Kennedy material. Like doing Kennedy material in the Mort Saul era became tacky. And, right. And Woody Allen, in a sense, said, like, that was one of the keys to my success that I wasn't one of those hundreds of guys that were doing John F. Kennedy material. It was like a guess cottage who, industry. Yeah. Yeah. Guess who was uh, young George Carlin. Oh, interesting. there's footage of him doing John Kennedy. There's an article about him when he was with his partner, the Joe Kennedy saw him. He That's did this I, impression of him. Like it was like, didn't Joe big, Kennedy get mad at him or something? Yes. Joe, yes, yeah. he did. Oh, somebody paid attention. <laughs> <to that> document. <laughs> I remember that yeah, Joe Kennedy had a few choice words for him. Yeah. Either directly or indirectly. I can't remember. Yeah. yeah. Joe Kennedy was super mad at Mort Saul also. So. Yeah. Well, so, another thing the documentary showed, which was really interesting, yeah. is that there's a direct line from Lenny Bruce to Carlin. And, in fact, uh, yeah. and, and Carlin, you can tell that story. Well, it's not even a, a, a story. It's a, uh, there's, I mean, Lenny Bruce was a social satirist is basically what he was, as opposed to like, I don't know, Joey Bishop or, uh, you know, Buddy Hackett or somebody like, you know what I mean? Just a comedian that was like a crowd pleasing comedian. Yeah. Like Lenny Bruce had something to say about the hypocrisy of mid-century America, whether you liked it or not. And he, he doused it with a lot of four letter words. And so a lot of people that became his thing. He was the dirty comic, but he really wasn't doing like dirty jokes. He was, you know, talking about the church and things like that, which is one of the reasons he got arrested multiple times. Yeah. And so, uh, so Carlin loved him, of course. And then there's one of his arrests. This is interesting to me anyway, but Lenny Bruce only got arrested in like big liberal cities, New York, LA, San Francisco, and Chicago. That's it. Those are the only cities that arrested him. And so he's in Chicago. And of course he does something. They look, show's over, the cops there. They clean out the place. And George Carlin is there with his wife, Brenda. (laughs) Just in the audience. Well, yeah, yeah, watching the show, you know. Yeah, so they met and they actually became friends and Carlin would visit uh, Lenny when he was out in California. And it's it's interesting that uh, there's a great quote, he's not in the documentary, but that, George Carlin says like he sort of became famous for using dirty words and Lenny's career got crushed for using dirty words. So he right. said, I know he goes on. I know a lot of people equate the two of us because they find that connection, but it actually made my career like the seven words you can't say on yeah. seven television made Carlin's career. So and could that, ju- that. that could I just be a case of the times having slightly changed enough to yeah. made, maybe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah and i mean carlin just was perfect timing and then don't forget hbo they start doing those hbo young comedian specials or not excuse me our specials not young comedian in 75 so right right in the you know peak hippie carlin career he does he ends up doing 14 of them yeah which is basically I feel the main way most people know George Carlin. What do you think of that? I agree with you. And I think one of the things I love about the documentary is you guys made the point of showing so many clips from probably those specials over the years where you get to see, oh my God, he was right about everything before everybody 
was right about anything. <laughs> and, and even, you know, with the reversal on Roe versus Wade, it wasn't some living comedian whose clip went viral, you know, speaking to what happened with the, you know, Roe v. Mm -hmm. Wade being overturned. It was George Carlin from a 1996 special, 14 years after his death, that spoke to that issue more than anybody alive, you know? So it's really interesting. Boy, these conservatives are really something, aren't they? They're all in favor of the unborn. They will do anything for the unborn. But once you're born, you're on your own. <laughs> Pro-life conservatives are obsessed with the fetus from conception to nine months. After that, they don't want to know about you. They don't want to hear from you. No, nothing. No neonatal care, no daycare, no head start, no school lunch, no food stamps, no welfare, no nothing. If you're pre-born, you're fine. If you're preschool, you're fucked. <laughs> you're fucked. But yeah, I feel like that a lot of people know him from those takes he would have. And it's interesting because as a historian of stand-up comedy, I've noticed that a lot of it doesn't age well, that it's very ephemeral. It's sort of like milk. It goes bad after a while. So it's really shocking that any of Carlin's stuff would resonate with people in 2010, 20, 22, or whatever year we are right now. Right. I think we're in August, 2022. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty remarkable, but that I think speaks to how incredibly articulate and succinct that guy was like he really framed his arguments in a very on like an airtight package right I don't know, what do you think i mean and he had such amazing dexterity with the language obviously yeah. people talk about that all the time but his wordplay everything is just it's music it's 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 beautiful to yeah. listen to yeah well that's one of the things i hope you got out of that documentary first of all he's a ninth grade dropout yeah second of all he was a big fan of Danny Kaye when he was a kid. Right. So if you really break down his bits, there's a lot of verbal, like you said, dexterity and acuity that that weave in and out of it. Even there's one thing we didn't even put in the special code, like it's called uh, I'm a modern man. And he just goes, I'm plugged in, uptight, da, 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 turned on, turned on. You know, and it's just like this list that goes on for five minutes. It's like, oh. He's doing the Danny K, you know, yeah, double speak, <laughs> or you know, patter, the patter, songs. Yeah, right. the patter songs that he did, you know, early in his his well throughout his career, he was just incredible with that. So it's just I love the guy so much. Thank and you for well, watching. Well, well, yeah, and the other great thing for you guys is you had such a treasure trove to work from. He saved everything, right? He he every cocktail napkin he wrote an idea down on. Everything was available to you guys. All these every idea yeah. or kernel of an idea and the order he put yeah, a set and, in and everything and unlike most comedians it's sort of like it's sort of a mishmash like he re he filed those things like oh this would be in this category this would be in this so it made it really and all of that stuff is uh, was donated to the national comedy center in jamestown new york a great vacation destination <laughs> the birthplace of vacation. lucille ball right yeah home of lucille ball there's a <laughs> yeah but it's really quite a museum there and uh it's just, they don't call it a museum, they call it a center, but it's, it's wild. Anything else I need uh, to talk well, about? Well, I mean, just, just to end on what, now that the documentary has been out for a few months, yes. for, for, for those people crazy enough not to have watched it already, it's on HBO Max, by the way. What, mm -hmm. what do you want people to take away from the documentary? Oh, that's a great question. What do I, well, I hope they're entertained. First of all, I hope they're entertained. Like he was a comedian and he wanted to make people laugh. And I hope you're laughing all the way through. So that's, the first thing. Two, I hope you're amazed by what an individual can do who's determined and dedicated. In a way, I know he his big thing is making fun of the American dream and we like you have to be asleep to believe it. But in my opinion, his career and life is the American dream. Yeah. Here's a kid who like his dad, you know, had a abusive dad. They had a escape from him literally down the fire escape right yeah they escape from him uh he's brought up by a single mom who works so he's a latchkey kid drops out of the ninth grade and has this dream of becoming a movie star and doesn't quite become that but realizes his real gift is crafting these comedy routines using what he sees around him as fodder and the society that he He's navigating through, and then he becomes extremely successful, you know, has a 
beautiful daughter that tours the world for years and years and years and has an impact has an yeah. impact not only on like there's this weird supreme court side of his life where he's now a president in the fcc decisions right and but just goes to show you like with determination and fortitude and talent uh you know he my takeaway was how much he worked i think yeah. that was my takeaway and we don't really go into it it's like oh he's a, i think his daughter says it he's like he was a road comic like he yeah. was touring the whole time always writing and creating new stuff so to me that's just the life of an artistic person he was ridiculous yeah. it was ridiculous how much he created i mean 14 hbo specials and and a bunch of albums before he got to hbo yeah so it's uh that that's my what about you what is your takeaway you watched it um well i there was i again laughed all the way through i uh -huh. i found there were so many so many things in it that were also touching his relationship with mm -hmm. his first wife and some of the family struggles they had and kelly's uh relationship with him and how honest she was and and you know i just thought uh it was a real portrait of not just the comedian but the man and i thought it was and i thought you guys just did a beautiful job ah thank you and I, I like that you're saying it to me behind my back i don't know what you're saying <laughs> no it's great thank you thank you no i i you know I'm thrilled. People, it's tomatoing at a hundred. I don't know. Yeah, what I'm nothing you does can't that. Get any higher than that. You, you can't, can't get, get a higher. can't get a one oh one on tomatoes. <laughs> That's nope. the highest you can get. It's the American dream. You did it. That's right. <laughs> I don't know why Carlin was complaining so much. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Wayne. I guess the next time I see you it won't be in a documentary, you'll be at the Emmys because you'll be there. You guys got five Emmy nods. So good luck at the Emmys and uh great job. It was just such a amazing, enjoyable documentary. Thanks again. All right, thank you, Wayne. I'll talk to you later.